This is dedicated to anyone that's been knocked down, but not out. The ones that fell to their knees, but rose back up. The ones that scratched and clawed, but never let go. The ones willing to admit their faults, move past their failures, and improve every single day. I hope these conversations encourage you to think critically, make you laugh hysterically, inspire you profoundly, and remind you to practice gratitude daily. My name is Iman Hushman. Welcome to the conversation. Welcome to Awesome People. Awesome people, welcome to another episode of the Awesome People Podcast. What a pleasure to have you again this evening. It's been so long. It's, I feel like it's been a long, long time since I've had an episode. Uh, and it's so good to be back in front of you. And I hope that wherever you are sitting and watching and enjoying a glass of wine, perhaps, that you're happy, that you're healthy, and that you're going to, uh, I don't know, join me in this conversation, meaning that at any time you can just uh, comment in the, in the YouTube chat below. Uh, if you're there in the chat, feel free to like the video, subscribe to our page, and hopefully we get to see you in many, many more episodes of Awesome People in the future. Having said that, this evening I have a very special guest. I always have a special guest, but I've really been looking forward to this guest this evening because what this wonderful, fabulous woman is doing alongside uh, a slew of other incredible women is something that is um, not just incredible, but I feel like it's something that has not been discussed and talked about enough in the Persian community, whether it's locally uh, in, in the U.S. or uh, internationally and globally. I feel like it is something that needs to have a spotlight shed on it. And I felt like the best way to do that is talk to the source, talk to the person who uh, is, the, is the creator of all this wonderful goodwill that is being happening. And the name of this individual is the wonderful, the fabulous Dr. Mojgan Hakimi. And uh, you know what? I'll just go ahead and just welcome this lovely individual on the screen. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll say Mojganjan. Durud Barsham. Merci. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody from Los Angeles. How's everybody? I hope you guys have a great weather. We have a great weather here in LA. You guys always have great weather over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Dr. Mojgan Hakimi, she is uh, uh, the department chair of the School of Psychology at Tura College in Los Angeles. And I really want to appreciate you for making time this evening to be with us so that we can talk about a plethora of things that really I believe that every Iranian, no matter where they're sitting in the world, should at least be aware of. Now, whether or not they're going to take action and support you and your endeavors, that's a whole different thing. But first and foremost, amplifying what you all are doing is incredibly important. But I'll get that. The, I'll get down to that in a second. You're obviously a clinical psychologist. And so I first want to ask, how did you even get into the field of psychology? What made you want to do what it is that you're doing today? Uh, I think uh, perhaps I come from the generation that when the revolution happened, I was uh, 13, 14 years old living in Iran. And I think a good majority of people in my generation ended up in the service business, whether they uh, migrated to the United States or even stayed in Iran. So uh, it's uh, very usual for my generation to be active in the field of healthcare, mental health care. And I'm just one of uh, many that's doing this in Los Angeles. Uh, but for the majority of my career life, I've been an academician more than a practitioner. Mm -hmm. I teach and I research at the university and that's been a place that I have been able to do my service better than uh, on one-on-one -on -one, uh, group setting or group settings. Uh, but the project that we have at hand is one that has gotten me into more of a practice than just preaching and theory. So maybe it was time for me to come out of from behind the books. And uh, I needed something strong, as strong as this to pull me out of the book world and into the practitioner side of the uh, mental health. Well, I'm sure that is very grateful that you decided to come out from behind the curtain and be center stage and do what you're doing alongside your army of incredible women. But before we even get to what you're doing currently, let's kind of take a step back and go to 2011. And you started an organization called the Persian Women's American Conference. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we do justice to what the history is behind it, the mission and the vision. So I would rather give you the virtual stage to kind of share with our audience. What is oh. PAWC, please? Uh, well, PAWC started uh, about close to 10 years ago. And uh, we were doing conferences in UCLA as in the post and in the role that I had 
as an academician. Uh, then we started doing some conferences that were only related to Iranian women. And the first one happened in 2011, 2012. And uh, the group of women that got together to do this were from various parts, parts of the country. They were not only in California or in Los Angeles, some came from New York, some came from Washington. And we decided to continue with this and Persian American Women Conferences was born. This is a nonprofit organization and has one simple mission, is to inspire, to empower, and to provide unconditional support for women. And uh, there are many other wonderful, incredible Iranian women organizations uh, globally, uh, and uh, many have different missions. Ours is not one of networking. Ours is not one of uh, uh, creating uh, relationships or promoting. Ours is one of unconditional support. Ours is one of empowering and inspiring. So the conferences are generally attended anywhere between five to 700 people attend their yearly conferences. And we've been incredibly lucky uh, that uh, women from other walks of life, not just the Iranian descended successful women, but other women in the community, in the global community have joined our conferences and validated the platform that we have. What would you say was the catalyst? What was the turning point that you said to yourself, you know what, there's really a need for this and I wanna go ahead and grab uh, the influential individuals around me, the passion of people around me that are like-minded, have the same mission that I have and I want to bring us together and lead us to the promised land. Uh, well, I don't know about the promised land. We all want to go there. But uh, <laughs> you're giving me a lot of credit. I don't know about that leadership quality. But I know that the first time that we had the conference, what came out of it was tremendous amount of honest emotion and energy all trapped in the uh, big auditorium of UCLA. And we realized, oh, my God, there's so much raw passion here that you cannot just let go of it. This was not an incident. This was not an accident. And we got together and decided to continue this on a yearly basis. The second year, we thought, OK, you know what? We, we were lucky the first year. The second year, we may not be able to deliver what they're looking for. But we became lucky year after year after year. And we realized that there's a need. Actually, what happened is that we did not address the need. I think the need created us. Mm. The need seeked us. That's why I think we became successful, because the need was there. And I'm going to be honest with you. I fell into it. I didn't have the vision to understand. I was so well hidden in the academic world that I never separated um, what I was doing due to gender or cultural dif differentiations. Everyone and everything was the same. But once this came through and the voice of the Iranian women was heard much louder, I think the need created us. We, we, I, to be honest with you, I didn't know. It was such a great need out there and what's will be so welcomed so i absolutely love that when you say that the need really created us and ironically it's really um it's my um what is it called my it was actually like i mean which what you all have been doing with the iranian refugees has influenced why i am here right now so essentially what has happened is kind of creating the need for me to want to have these conversations and have the pleasure of speaking to you. And so now that we're transitioning to the plight of so many Iranian refugees around the world and specifically in, in Greece and Turkey, can you please take me to the first time that you realize that there is a need to support our countrymen and countrywomen and there is this, um, there is this uh, unreal, unbelievable, unfathomable situation that is surrounding uh, our countrymen and women and children. Can you take me back to when you were first introduced to this situation? Uh, sure. Just uh, like w the subject that we, uh, we addressed before, just like the conferences. In one of the conferences, one of our uh, lovely guests was Princess Yasmin Pahlavi. As you know, she's an incredibly accomplished woman. She is a practicing lawyer for many years. Uh, she's been addressing the outcry of women and children in need in the area of Washington, D.C. So she's, she's very well known for, for what she's done, doing and has been doing for a long time. We invited her as a guest um, and uh, as an intellectual Iranian descended, uh, Iranian American woman to be part of our conference. And the chemistry between her and the remaining of the leadership 
in the PAWC continued even after when the conference was finished. So she would visit us yearly in our other conferences. And it was 2019 that I got a call from her and she said, Mojban, this situation is happening with the refugees in uh, Greece and I'm going to visit them. Would you like to come with me as a uh, psychologist, as a clinician, not just as a friend? And it was her that introduced and opened the door. And again, the need created yeah. what uh, you're going to get to know in a few minutes, uh, which is called a Mental Health Beyond Borders, which is a division of PAWC. It was the need for to address and to help these refugees in Greece, in Lesbos, Athens, in Turkey, and in other areas uh, that uh, when I came back to Los Angeles after spending the time with uh, Princess Yasmin in um, Greece, we came back here and I we talked hours on the phone besides crying and, 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 and feeling desperate, fe feeling uh, depressed, uh, uh, not knowing what to do. Uh, you know, you, after you pull yourself up with your bootstraps and you say, okay, I've got to do something. So contacted professionals, women, clinicians, and you would not believe Iman John with every phone call. The answer was, of course, Moji John, what, what do you want me to do? All of these women that you're going to meet shortly on, on a video clip that we created from there, where they are, have been there for the year and a half, side by side of these refugees, they have donated their time, they have donated their expertise, and many, many often, uh, in many situations, often donated financially to make sure that everything goes according to schedule and people on the other side of the shore are not in need. So they're dedicated women, and I was lucky to fall into that team with them and be able to address some of the uh, painful uh, cases that we saw when we visited uh, Greece with uh, uh, yeah, Princess I, mean, I, I can only imagine how painful it was in person because um, at this point I've watched the incredible documentary that I want to give a shout out to Iran International and Ms. Khamei who, who created this uh, documentary. I mean, it's like I, I literally watched it again a couple of nights ago and I had tears coming down my cheek because I still don't want to believe that our my, our cousins essentially our brothers and sisters are going through this and I'd love to actually play a clip from from that documentary that you were in where uh, Bola Azrat Yasemin Pahlavi uh, you know introduced you into this and uh, you can you get to see one of the uh, refugees there sharing her plight with her child so uh, ladies and gentlemen watch this video from Iran International it's a documentary called uh, the voiceless uh, refugees. I highly recommend that you watch on YouTube, just uh, YouTube, uh, the voiceless refugees, and watch that one-hour uh, documentary. Please enjoy. یه مهمون دیگه که شما دعوت دید خانم دکتر حکیمی هستن. میخوان کمی بیشتر توضیح بدید که بله بله چرا فکر کردید که اینقدر ایشون خب نه تنها دکتر روانشناس خیلی شناخته هستن بلکه دوست خیلی خوب من هستن و در مورد پناهجویان و صدمه ای که بهشون امکان داره بیفته و خصوصا به بچه های کوچیک و خانم های تنها و مادرای بی خانمان خیلی تحقیق کردن و وقتی که من تصمیم گرفتم که این سفر رو بیام که دیداری داشته باشم با پناهجویان اینجا بهشون که زنگ زدم همین داشتم فقط میگفتم که برنامه چی و دلم میخواد این کارو بکنم اصلا بدون آنی گفتن منم میام سلام سلام بابا اگر یه راهی هست که فکر میکنین ایشون به به شما بتونن یه کمکی برسن یا به جوانای دیگه ای که اینجا هستن مثل که در اختیارتون هست نه در اختیارتون در اختیارتون چی گفت؟ کلن میگه پولیس داری میاد با چون ما رو بزنه این پولیس میخواد ما رو برگردونه بچه من وقتی تو جنگل و تو دریا پولیس دید پولیس اومد با چوب با چابو و اینا خواستن ما رو نگه دارن که به یونان نرسید بچه من هر وقت آب میبینه دریا میبینه هرچی میگه پلیس سلام میخواد بیاد ما رو بزنه بله ما خیلی دوست داشتم اینجا یه روانشناسی یه روانکاوی به من بگه واقعا باید با بچه هم چجوری رفتار کنم 
متاسفانه دارو خیلی گرونه چند روز پیش بچه من سرما خورده بود به خاطر ویروسی که گرفته بود ما مجموع شدیم بریم بیمارستان توی بیمارستان اونجا ما مشکل ترجمه داشتیم من نمیدونم داروهایی که به بچه من زدن اصلا چی بوده بله من دیروز یه ملاقاتی داشتم با یه خانم یونانی گفتم که ما دکتر لازم داریم دندون ساز لازم داریم کسی که بیان سر بزنن به پناشون و اینا بهش تمام این چیزها رو توضیح دادم و به نظر می آمد که خیلی درش میخواد کمک کنه حالا من دنبالش رو میگیرم میشه تا این چند روزی که اینجا هستیم به ما یه چند تا دکتر معرفی کنه آمیتان. که بیان و یه ذره کمک باشه ما در پدرها طبیعتا افسردگی هست، طبیعتا استراب هست، اونا چیزایی نیست که یک شبه بشه از بین بود ولی با دادن دلگرمی مثل وجود بالا حضرت، وجود بقیه کسایی که آمدن و نشون اینا دادن که شما ها دیده میشین، شما ها شنیده میشین مقدار خیلی زیادی از این افسردگی و استراب رو کم میکنم و اون عشق و اینا چقدر قشنگ دارن از ایشون میبینن و دارن پس میدن So that was again one little clip from The Voices Refugees, which you can YouTube on uh, under the name of Iran uh, International, The Voices Refugees. I highly, highly recommend it. Please sit back, watch it with your families, and you're going to find out very soon how you can support these individuals. And so, Mojganjan, um, we're here with Dr. Hakimi. Uh, we said, I'm sorry, but uh, um, let, let, let's start by kind of just uh, you know asking you flat out when you were there at what I consider ground zero. What what was the tell me how you felt? What what was the impact? Um, the impact. Well, let me tell you that we have about 65 million displaced uh, refugees in the world. Out of that, those 65 million. About 16 and a half are documented in um, UNHCR, which is the United Nations Human uh, Commission Relation. So uh, the Refugee Committee. So there is a huge portion that is undocumented. There's a huge portion that are not being addressed. And uh, truly watching that and going through the camps is heartbreaking, is heart-wrenching. It was not my first exposure to refugee camps, uh, but it was my first exposure to an Iranian refugee camp where I saw my people. Uh, you know, you would think as a professional, this should not make any difference, that everyone is equal and it is equal. Your heart breaks when you see a child, regardless of color and creed. Uh, but uh, for some reason- uh, It touches home. Can't imagine, yeah, you can't imagine how much more you can be in pain once they start talking to you in the language that is your first language and they talk to you and they stick to you and they don't want to let go of your legs or they don't want to let go of your hand and the mothers tell you about their uh, painful experiences, the abuses that's been happening. So all of what we uh, saw, Princess Yasmin and I saw uh, absolutely took a toll on all of us and uh, it was not easy. It was not easy and we uh, continuously tried to find a way why we were there to address those needs. And uh, time was not on our side. We didn't have enough time. By the time we would do the visits, we had to go back and then get ready for another set of visits and another set of, uh, in my case, need assessments. I would meet with them, talk to them. And that gave me some sort of a uh, foundation to work with. So when I came back to Los Angeles, I had gathered enough data to be able to say, okay, now this is what I'm facing. This is what's happening. I, I, of course, to be honest with you, after the weeks of incredible depression and uh, not wanting to get out of the bed, crying and crying and being in the shower and crying so my husband wouldn't hear me. Then it was the next stage, which was, okay, now we've got to do something. It was those raw data that I gathered uh, from talking to people, from writing down, jotting down everywhere that I could on my phone, on pieces of paper, in the van, is that I could put everything together and realize this is what I think, well, for, for lack of a, you know, my limited knowledge, this is what I think we're facing. And uh, first thing is first, we need to help these people uh, by just providing support. Support was the first key. It was my... It was an understanding that no matter what, emotional, financial, 
support has to be provided. So that's why Mental Health Beyond Borders was born. Called up colleagues, called up friends, people in the same field that were all Iranian descended. Um, and they were all, uh, they were all fluent in Farsi because I could not, a lot of my students are Iranian, but I could not use them because they were born and raised in the United States. They couldn't communicate in Farsi. And uh, all the refugees had just migrated from Iran. They didn't speak any other language than Farsi. So it was very difficult to find well-seasoned clinicians that spoke the language, understood the culture, but were trained and licensed. So that's how we began. So what, what did you find to be, like if you had to put an order of like, this was the first need but during your assessment, you know, like what, what did you see that was absolutely dire needs? This is right now, red alert, this needs to be addressed. What did you find most commonly? The first thing that you know, it's, it's quite impossible to walk into those camps and not see the level of hopelessness, the level of depression, the acute anxiety, and the complex PTSD that exists. Now, a lot of clinical words that I threw out there, but all of us are familiar with uh, PTSD. We've heard it enough, whether it's because of the pandemic or since 9-11, there has been, that, that word has been used. So it's part of a global language. But the cases we see there is different than the normal PTSD that we see. These are chronic, complex ones. They start and they go on for years to come. When someone is a refugee, the first stage that they face is a pre-flight stage. When you and I decide to leave our country, where, no matter where that country is, there's a reason we're leaving it. We are either under oppression or we are being, um, for any reason, we're being prosecuted for our political ideology, for artistic ability, for our gender preferences, for anything. We are being prosecuted. And the first part is the anxiety and the fear that starts. This is couple of years even before deciding to migrate. So that's the primary. Then it gets to a point that you realize that, no, I have to leave. I cannot stay here anymore. This is the second phase, which we call it the flight of the refugee. Mm. And that is a very difficult phase. This is a phase that it has displacement in it. This is a phase that uh, when you and I are in that phase, even though sometimes refugees plan to leave their country, they come out with what they consider to be international monetary. Uh, uh, some bring dollars with them, some bring any other, uh, you know, euros to be able to carry them to the destination they're seeking. It doesn't really matter because uh, through the time that they're leaving the country of origin, they generally get robbed. There's general financial abuse that happens. Rarely the people, the coyotes that take them to the other side of the border are the people that will allow them to get away with all of the finances that they have. So the abuse, sometimes financial, uh, many times sexual in cases the, of women and children and young men, uh, many times uh, uh, I would say physical and uh, naturally all the time verbal happens in the flight stage. Now it gets complicated because in some cases, you even have to separate the child from the parent to be able to do this migration because the child might be too young. Sometimes women give birth in that stage. So it, it has its own complications. Now, let's say you were lucky enough to get out of the border, come to the other side. What is waiting for you is not what they expect. It's not the, what they've seen in the Turkish movies or in the, or in the American movies or in whatever movies that they've seen. This is a whole new world out there. And uh, that is where we got to see them. It's when they arrive. These are candalescent affairs. They arrive, they generally get into camps that are supported by the United Nations. But the number of people that need to be addressed and need to be taken care of in these camps is probably 10 times the amount that the camp can uh, provide for. So from the beginning, you have a scarcity of resources. From the beginning, you have a problem uh, that the debilitating anxiety and the, uh, in many cases, the survivor guilt comes to visit you. Throughout the flight, you've lost a parent, you've lost a child, you've lost a partner. These are the things you've lost and you have survived the flight. So now you're in a very bad position. You think 
maybe I should not have done that. Maybe you now the remorse is coming in. Now, meanwhile, you're staying in these camps. You're not able to get a job. You're not able to take care of your family. And what, what, what is so devastating to see for Princess Yasmin and I, what was, what was so difficult to see was the young men that would come to you privately and say, I took my family out. I took my young children out for a better future. And I feel like I cannot provide anything for them. The depersonalization that happens in these camps. Uh, they're robbed of uh, everything and the shame and the guilt that's attached to it. Now, when this goes on for a period of time, you see a very frightful, a quite scary uh, clinical syndrome that is called the resignation syndrome that we see this generally with uh, refugees or uh, we see it sometimes with um, uh, cases of concentration where the person in question has given up on all possible hope and they have resigned. Nothing else matters. They know they cannot do this anymore. They've left the country for five years. They're living in these camps. They were supposed to be able to become legal. They're not able to change their status. Continuously, whatever they do, they hit a block. They cannot move forward. So this, um, there's a coma-like um, state. It's an emotional coma in which you're not doing anything. You're not moving anymore because nothing really matters. It's a sense, very strong. It's stronger than a sense of helplessness. It's a proven sense of helplessness. It's a, it's a complete and utter loss of hope. Yes, it is. It is. That's so. You're going back to your question, which I guess it took me a long time to answer. Is the uh, resignation syndrome, the complete, as you mentioned, loss of hope that nothing matters anymore. And, and I am oh, sorry. dependent. I am dependent on everything and everyone, and I am not able to provide for my family. I'm not able to take care of my child. I am a nothing. And, and obviously we all know that they are everything. And what I really enjoyed and loved about the documentary is is the part that I included in tonight's episode is the part that you say you, you, we do see you, we do hear you, and you know you you are we, we, you know your 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 presence is important to us, and they're beautiful human beings that they deserve the opportunity to live a a, a safe life and the opportunity that everybody else does, and that is to be able to provide for their family and to be proud of that, you know. And so um, the, the the hope is not lost for uh, you know mm -hmm. overall. And we hope that through conversations like this, through your efforts and what we're about to announce in the remaining part of the episode, that we all can come together and wrap our arms around uh, these individuals so that they also see the hope that exists and that they, they have the energy to continue to move forward and get, the, get themselves out of the situation that they're in. Um, let's, let's talk about numbers, uh, Mojang John, is, and, and how many, because I know there's been an influx of number of yes. refugees since 2013. and. The last statistics that I saw uh, in your report was 2018. Mm -hmm. So first of all, uh, let us know about those numbers that increased drastically from 2013 to 2018. And if you happen to have any kind of update on where we stand now, post pandemic or during pandemic, wh where are we right now? We probably, it's a double since 2018. So 2018, this is only you have to realize, these numbers belong to uh, uh, Lesbos and Greece. This is not, uh, the Iranian refugees throughout Europe. This is one particular location. Right, right. So estimation was in a couple of thousand as we uh, left uh, uh, 2018, 2019. Uh, but undoubtedly, the numbers have grown. But you have to understand that in Turkey, the numbers are tremendously different. They are much higher. Serbia, Germany, there are so many other camps that we have our countrymen living there as refugees, and we were only able to address Lesbos and we were only able to address Greece for the time being. We're starting some work in Turkey, but uh, mostly still in Greece. So the numbers that I gave you around 1800 in uh, 2018 belongs only to that country, not right. all worldwide. Absolutely. And um, so I, I know that there's this one wonderful community center uh, in Athens uh, that, that you all are fully supporting at this point. It is Kafe Patok. Um, I'd, I'd like for you to uh, talk a little bit more about Kafe Patok and 
It's being run by a young man who's also a refugee or was a refugee, yeah. uh, Arash. And as you talk about Kafir Patur, we have some footage uh, in the background that's going to be playing from the documentary. Mm -hmm. So tell us about Kafir Patur. Tell us about the service that they're providing, and the benefits that they're providing, and how uh, when you support or when others support uh, the GoFundMe, which we'll talk about shortly, what, where all that money is going and how it's actually impacting these individuals. Kafir Patur is in Athens and it's being ran by the refugees and it's been actually uh, uh, led uh, by a refugee named Orash <clears throat> who has gone through all the plight that we talked about and is quite familiar with the processes of being a refugee in that country. Kafir Patur provides hot food, provides classes, provides a safe haven for, for the uh, refugees to come to and in many, many cases. Uh, the refugees that come there are not only Iranian descended, some are Afghanis, we have had Lebanese. Uh, the doors are not closed to anyone, even though Kata is an you know, Iranian community center, but the doors has been open to everyone and other uh, refugees have been using it. Uh, before the pandemic, we had classes. We actually, with the help of a, a lot of wonderful people we were able to create a very small factory like entity there so uh, people can create clothes and people can sew and uh, sell their products in the um, public bazaar in Athens we had uh, classes for young men and women to speak English we were looking into getting uh, uh, high school accredited courses which we hit pandemic and we couldn't move forward with that. But this safe haven has been a place that they can come to from the camps. You have to realize that during the day, when people are in camps, the refugees are in camps, they're not doing anything. And the fact that they have nothing to do and they're hanging out around these uh, common areas causes gang fights, causes uh, various kinds of abuse and once they have a place to go to to learn to read to work actually to work out to do anything possible to be positive and to be outside of that uh, uh, gang infested neighborhood and gang infested uh, community um, especially young people get a second chance of uh, you know doing something while they're able to get their papers ready and able to go to school or able to migrate to the destination of their choice um, so, Kafa Pato is is really the one thing that right now that you actually have a GoFundMe page that is active and uh, it's been kind of like the um, the conduit of of your fundraising efforts, you know, to kind of support this community center. So, and very right now, I think that it's up on the screen for anybody that would like to support the GoFundMe. I, I believe that uh, it's in the works for you and even Valaza to hopefully go back. To yes. um, okay. you know, uh, Kafe Patog, and just you know, sh yeah. show love and support for all these individuals. What what is the one thing that you believe that these individuals would benefit the most right now? Where if somebody is considering to to donate or to support, what is the number one thing that you believe that they would benefit from right now? Is it the help from your colleagues and yourself, where to be able to speak to them? Is there something else that they um, would benefit the most? You know, the needs are so abundant and, uh, and they are also urgent. But first and foremost would be to create security for them. Believe, or not, believe it or not, we have a lot of young women and not that uh, other groups that are there are not of urgency. But when you have young women sleeping in the streets because they don't want to spend another night in the camps, if there was anything I could do to create a shelter for these women, to at least make sure that, because we're in Capapato, they cannot sleep at night. Mm -hmm. They come and they stay with us all day. But then when it comes, you know, when it's dark and they have to go back to the camps and some of these young women are not safe and secure there. Uh, so if there, was, if there was a way that we could create a dormitory, shall we call it, for a lot of these young women to be there. And there we could help them learn a lot of other uh, salvo technique uh, uh, work that they can go out there and uh, support themselves once they become a legal uh, person in the country of uh, Greece for that matter or the country of choice that they need to migrate but if we can before doing that if we can have a shelter for them if we can have a place that they could go there learn how to sew learn how to work with computers 
to become an individual that is enabled to take care of herself, I think it reduces the possibility of uh, uh, their abuse. Right. It doesn't, uh, you know, um, take all the, I mean, it is still there, but it definitely gets reduced. Right. It's not eliminated. But... And I mean, having a skill set doesn't only increase the opportunity of getting a job, but then there's that feeling of self-worth that you have, did you bring value to an organization, bring value to individuals? So I can certainly understand uh, that mm -hmm. benefit. Now, obviously, so if somebody was able to spend or donate hundreds of thousands of dollars, the dormitory would be great. Uh, for now, you and your colleagues have created the mental health uh, would be on Borders Division, which graciously so many uh, lovely individuals are donating their time yes. and, and their, 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 their educational background to support. So I feel like this is a great opportunity for you to first share uh, all the things that they're doing through these Zoom sessions that they're donating their time. Yes. And then you can lead into us playing that wonderful um, seven to eight minute segment where they get to talk about the impact that their involvement has had. You know, I'm not going to talk much about it because they've done a great job telling you what they do when you play that segment. But I have to tell you, the only one thing that I need to uh, make sure that we get that across is that once I came back, I realized that uh, the one on one work is incredibly important because we had many cases of attempted suicide, many, many, many cases of attempted suicide. And we've had many cases of rape. We had many cases of uh, incest. And uh, this, this was not something that you could do in a group therapy. You needed individual one-on-one uh, -on -one care sessions. That's why we started, um, so I started soliciting these young women that you're gonna hear from them. I will let them tell everybody else what they've been doing and how they've been committing themselves to create hope and create a better future Absolutely. for these individuals. With pleasure. And uh, we'll definitely go ahead and play this video now. And I, I will just preface one thing is that after we play this video, when we come back and as we reach almost an hour of this a very important conversation, uh, I have some announcements that I would like to share with you, Mojo and John and the viewers. And hopefully, okay. hopefully it will be something that will bring our community together, das to das, unite and conquer and be able to uh, truly support these individuals that are in dire needs of our help. So for our viewers, first and foremost, watch these heroic women that are, uh, uh, you know, donating their time uh, to to support our, our brothers and sisters. And then when we come back, I'll share this announcement and we'll continue with the wonderful Dr. Mojgan Hakimi. Stay with us. Mental Health Beyond Borders, licensed clinicians have been giving their expertise selflessly for more than a year to the refugees that are residing in Greece, especially in the island of Lesbos, living in the camps in the most atrocious conditions. Together, we'll hear their stories and their experiences. My name is Azadi Bulur Afari. I am a licensed therapist for the past 20 plus years. I'm certified in EMDR and trauma therapy, which has led me to step into an additional role for the past year, helping a lot of refugees who struggle with finding the space to feel safe and having an identity to exist and grow into all that they can be. My hope is that in the near future, everyone, every human being will have the opportunity to have safety, comfort, and the space to be who they deserve to be. My name is Sylvia Hakim. I'm a licensed uh, therapist. I've been working as a therapist for 15 years. Uh, I was approached last year to work with a few clients in uh, Greece and Turkey, the refugees, and uh, to give uh, voice to voiceless, to show them that their feelings matter and their voices are heard. It was an honor for me to work with them and to still hope and encouragement 
and feed them spoon by spoon of hope and encouragement and to, to let them know that I see them, I hear them from, from another part of the world, that I see them and I hear them. That gave them so much uh, hope. Hi, my name is Homa Halimi Nasizadeh. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist. I've been privileged and honored to be able to help people for the past 16 years with their mental health, such as anxiety, depression, marital problems, trauma, abuse. About a year ago, I was approached to help refugees in Turkey who have been uh, displaced, and it's been quite intense yet exhilarating to be able to work with these individuals across the world. It's been a privilege and honor to be able to help these individuals at a time where their lives are chaotic and traumatic and give them the tools and the support that they need. Um, I hope to be able to continue doing this with this wonderful team of women who have dedicated their time and energy to this beautiful cause. Hello. My name is Moshkan York, and I'm a clinical psychologist and an academician in the field. I was very happy to answer the call a year ago and join the group Mental Health Without Borders, where we try to connect across the oceans on an emotional and human level with a group of refugees who feel forgotten by the world and for the most part have lost hope and their purpose for life. My personal wish is that as I connect with each individual, that I'm able to hold the desperately needed hope for everyone until the day that they are able to hold that hope for themselves. Hello, my name is Eleanor More. I am a clinical psychologist working in California, specifically Beverly Hills. I've been doing this for many years. My specialty is mostly working with individuals and couples, particularly in their crisis and trauma work. It was about uh, roughly about a year ago that it came to my attention that there is a need <coughs> for helping some of the refugees with their emotional issues, with the um, trauma that they're going through. Um, and there was a need just for someone to have a listening ear. I'm very honored that I can take a small part in this humanitarian work. Uh, I'm Milufar Yoshar. Uh, I have been a licensed marriage family therapist and a doctor of psychology working as a clinician for over the past 20 years working in community-based clinics and in private practice. Uh, the focus of my practice has been mostly working with families, children, uh, and individuals. And about two years ago, I had the privilege to start working with a group of refugees. Through my work with these group of refugees, something that has really stuck in my mind is to see how much, regardless of their age, regardless of their social status, regardless of their political preferences, how they're all being inflicted by trauma and how they have all been um, pressed by uh, systematic uh, discrimination, oppression, uh, creating difficult life situations for them. And it's really has stuck into my mind in a personal level that, you know, what have they been running from that they are able to endure these difficult situations that um, they are going through and have these horrific life experiences. And my work has really been to instill hope for them, 
uh, to support them, to have somebody to hear them, somebody to be consistent there for them and uh, provide them with some coping skills to manage their anxiety and just be able to deal with difficult life situations. The energy and the key to the success of these volunteers and these professional clinicians have been the sense of empathy. And it's their sense of empathy that has caused the lives of these refugees to become better. Every day, every hour, every week that they spend one-on-one -on -one time over the phone, over the Zoom, or on conference calls with each and every one of these refugees has been a testament to how you can change misery and pain by lighting one candle at a time. All right. Well, um, incredible words by incredible women. Um, just for a second, um, just tell me a little bit more about these incredible ladies that you're surrounded about around. Yeah, I'm very, very lucky. Um, our team is, uh, I have to really make this clear. When you talk about donations, people need to know that whatever they donate, it goes directly to the cause. Nobody's getting paid in this organization. They are all donating their time, their expertise, and uh, they also give financial donations. We don't pay for rent. We don't pay for staff. We don't pay for anything. So every dollar goes directly to the refugees because the need is so much that we end up, uh, you know, uh, we're always short. And uh, the empathy, the love, and the energy behind what these women do, I think it's, it's unbelievable. And uh, I sometimes think angels come in all shapes and sizes, and some of them are those women that you just heard. Well, I have no doubt that um, if I were to speak with the, with the refugees who have been uh, yes. you know, affected by your team, they, they would consider all of you nothing less than uh, angels in this world. And on behalf of uh, Iranians around the world, I truly appreciate what you all are doing. And I know it's not easy. I know it's emotionally distressing for all of you. Uh, I, you know. You, you all being psychologists, one would think that you have some kind of armor where you're protected from the emotional impact that you yourselves take. But, you know, you take it all in and, uh, you know, we commend you for your strength. Um, you know, you, you can depend, depend on Iranian women, she is on to be able to handle this type of monumental um, effort. So really appreciate all of you for all that you're doing. And uh, the lovely Hale Kohan, oh, thank you so much for being such a wonderful support in organizing this uh, podcast with you and um, or with more than um, and, and I hope to have the opportunity to meet all the incredible ladies in your organization and, and thank them for their efforts. And all I'm trying to do is really, along with my team, not even just myself, is to just continue to support your efforts. And uh, in the past few weeks, um, you know, I was I was contemplating what I can do. Uh, given uh, what I do to basically, um, you know, just continue to wrap my arms around your efforts and say, hey, we're here with you. Um, and and that is that, so for those who don't know, I'm, my background is entertainment. We've been doing events and weddings and concerts for too many years, 23 years now. And uh, obviously the, the past year and a half almost because of the pandemic, we've been shut down, which the good part was that we started the podcast. So I'm very blessed to have had this opportunity. And now that we're about to restart some of our public events, I said to myself, you know, what can I do to kind of really be a part of what you all are doing and be able to, um, you know, just have a small impact on, on all that you all are doing. And um, what I came up with is that we have a series of public events that are coming up. And we have in the D.C. area uh, a Friday night boat series called Rock the Boat that's starting Friday, June 25th in Georgetown, which we've done for several years in the past. It was very popular. We have a Sunday event series in the D.C. area called AIR. It's the biggest outdoor, under the stars, international affair that we used to have for several years before the pandemic. And uh, we have a new live stream under United Conquer umbrella called Zendegi. It's our Persian DJs playing nothing but Persian music. Uh, and that's, again, a video live stream. And um, what I'm here to share with you, Mojganjan, and the rest of the PAWC team, 
uh, and uh, the viewers is that every event that I'll be having uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, as long as there are people coming, if they're joining our events, whether they're live, whether they're online, I will always have a portion of the proceeds continue to go to your efforts. It's going to be going to directly oh PAWC uh, because I want this to be a truly community effort. And if I was myself in the financial position to write a check, I would. But instead, I want to encourage the community who have been supporting our events and coming to our boat rides, coming to our air events, coming to uh, enjoy even the even the podcast right here, the Awesome People podcast. It's a free a live stream, obviously. Uh, nobody on our team is getting paid. We're investing our time and energy for this stuff. And so anybody who ever donates to the Awesome People podcast, if they come to our events, uh, I will continue to just share with the community the donations that we make. And they might not be big in the beginning, but I have utmost confidence in the Persian community in the D.C. area. I have events lined up in Miami that's coming. And I have the utmost confidence in our viewership, which, again, it's not a big viewership, but I know it's an amazing small group of people that continue to watch and support our podcast. And um, to, to hold true to my word, every time that we make a donation, I'll make a screenshot and the, and the money will always go directly to PAWC. And hopefully it will avalanche into something big, you know? You know, Imanjuri, it's, it's, I'm sure, I'm sure. And I hope and my wish is that there will not be a need for such a thing. But unfortunately, there is. Yeah. Uh, we will welcome anything and uh, I'm sure Princess Yasmin, myself and all the clinicians and everybody else that's involved in this appreciates everything that uh, you're doing, your team is doing and thank you. Thank you for uh, pursuing us until I came on the air and thank you for, for not giving up on us. No, we were busy. It's, 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 my, it's, my, it's my pleasure and I, and I feel like I found a new sisters in California uh, whose efforts I'm so enamored by, and I feel like it's every Iranian's obligation. I, I hate to use the word obligation because it should come from the heart and not as an obligation, but we have more than 85 million Iranians around the world, and if there are 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 refugees, they need to become zero. And I have no doubt that as long as we continue to have conversations like this, and I will do everything to gather my Rolodex of uh, incredible and awesome Persians around the world to, to continue to spread awareness about this because that I believe is the missing link. It's not that Persians are not supporting, is that not enough conversations are being had about this. You can watch American TV at two o'clock in the morning and there's hours and hours of commercials for St. Jude's, for, for saving hunger of uh, African children. There's dogs and cats that need support. And all those are very important too, but you don't see those commercials in, in the Persian TVs. You don't see it in the Persian podcast. And again, my voice is extremely small right now, but you have my word that I'm going to unite and conquer with some other awesome Persians that I know that they care about this mission as much as you all do. And you're not alone. You're appreciated. We love what you do. And together we will be able to uh, wrap our arms around the Iranian refugees and get them out of the camps, out of Greece, out of Turkey, and anywhere else there may be. That is my mission right now, and I appreciate you for opening my eyes to what's happening uh, in, in, in those countries. And, um, you know, like I said, I'll do whatever I can, and hopefully over time we'll be able to make the impact that we all would like to have. Thank you, Imanjun, for your passion, for your honesty, and for the fact that you sneaked us. I'm so blessed that you found us. And you are right. I was just where you are two years ago. I didn't know that we had Iranian refugees that are living in the conditions they are. So even if people are finding out through this podcast, it's nobody's fault. We, nobody has been talking about it. And thank you for unveiling this. No, of course. Thank and and, and on, on a closing note, I do have to uh, you know, thank Vala uh, Azrat, Yasami Palavi, and and as well as Shah for for that conversation that allowed me to even you know find out about this. So credit to her. Uh, all I'm trying to do is is you know be on that same mission that she she got on a couple of years ago. And uh, I think that we're going to be able to make a major impact together. So thank you again for all that you're doing and for all the viewers. Please go to pawcla.org. Um, uh, and, you know, there's always a GoFundMe, which if you follow me on Instagram, click the link in my bio. I have the GoFundMe link in my uh, in my link tree as well, as well as in the Unite and Conquer. And uh, but if it's a larger donation, just contact them directly. Let's bypass a GoFundMe fee. There's no reason why we have to have a few percentage of it go to um, 
go fund me god bless go fund me but let let the money go directly to the individuals that's that need true. it and um you know and, and it's not a profit organization so it's 100 percent tax deductible yes absolutely so um young lady it was an absolute pleasure thank you so much for your time on this wednesday evening and i i you're going to be hearing a lot more from me so i apologize in advance but it's for a great cause <laughs> Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful evening. And to all the wonderful viewers of awesome people, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and have a wonderful, blessed evening wherever you are in the world. Much love, respect. Ciao. Thank you.